Let's talk some hoops. One of my favorites, whenever we can get him on, is Jeff Van Gundy. Uh, morning. How are you? Doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm just, I get excited when I get to spend some time with you. Okay. We have seen a scoring barrage in the NBA. Uh, maybe unlike, you know, everything always seems to go back to Wilt, which is its own planet. Uh, whether it's Mitchell, whether it's the Stanchich run prior to the Boston game. Um, it's just, it's nuts. What do you think it is? What do you think are the main factors for why we're seeing so many amazing individual performances? I think great skill uh, and uh, increased space on the floor uh, because of the three-point shooting threats. Uh, I think the way the game is officiated uh, has a big impact. And I think because teams are not running offense as much, I'd be very interested to see if the great players have the ball in their hands uh, for a larger percentage of the time now. Um, and then I think, too, I, I think the way NBA teams practice or don't practice now, that's where you could generate your defensive habits and defensive intensity um, and attention to detail. And because teams don't practice very often, I think you've seen a great slippage defensively as well. So I think it's a culmination of all those things in my mind let's stay on the practice thing how often did you practice when you hit we were the coach of the Knicks yeah we practiced um uh team practice you know like obviously everybody even today you know guys will do their individual work but we would team practice um often now we we also believed heavily both in Houston and in New York in days off. So we gave off a lot of days off. You know, the obvious ones were, you know, after back to backs. Um, and we really regulated how much contact we did. Uh, let's say you played a game, then you had a practice and you had another game. You know, you don't just want to regulate how long you're on the floor, in my mind, but how much you hit, how much you go live. But you could still generate through drill work. Um, clean up necessary areas and also generate some intensity through semi-live drill work. So I I think, you know, when you're in coaching, that's the art of it. Um, No physiologist is going to say a guy's in a red zone today and I'm going to be convinced that he should not practice. I think sometimes we have to sacrifice what may be best for an individual for the betterment of the team and for the betterment of the team oftentimes, and this is where I was really blessed, Ewing um, always did everything, wanted to do everything, but you could limit his reps, but he never came onto the practice floor not expecting to do exactly what the 12th man would do. And I think that's a great blessing to have as a head coach, because it sets a tone that practice is important, that that's where we're going to improve. And whether you won or lost, you know, I hear now you either win or you learn. I I, I hate those type of cliches. Like you should be able to learn from both situations and every day is an opportunity to improve a little bit. Okay. So let's get back to the players thing here and I was looking at it right now we have 14 players averaging 20 field goal attempts per game five years ago it was two 10 years ago Kobe took 23 shots a game nobody took over 20 so we're at 14 um load management isn't as excessive with the top players this season because I've tracked this stuff as it was last year um so that's part of it I agree on the officiating the spacing certainly the skill so it's not a negative on this but I I almost feel like and I don't know if it's a numbers influence thing which I actually enjoy a lot of the numbers but I wonder if teams went like with Harden hey this is how efficient we are when he's on the floor this is how efficient he is per possession so why are we forcing the issue and having other guys get turns when he's the best guy with the turns and I can understand that argument and I think we're seeing a lot of that. But I also think from just a basketball standpoint, and it's one of my favorite things I ever learned, Larry Brown, I interviewed him very early on with the Detroit Pistons, I mean, years and years ago, and I was just a young shithead, and I'm like, why is Ben Wallace getting post-ups? <laughs> right? And Larry Brown goes, 
because I want Ben Wallace to enjoy playing basketball. Because if I get Ben Wallace a couple touches and there's a few plays for Ben Wallace, I know he's going to rebound harder. I know he's going to defend harder. I know he's going to be more engaged for the minutes that he's out there if he knows he's not going to be ignored the entire time. Because having the ball is fun. Shooting is fun. And I've never forgotten that. And I, I believe it so much in basketball that sometimes when I look at some of these offenses where it's like, well, we're most efficient when we do this, and we see these massive scoring games from these unbelievable players, I wonder if that's to the detriment of what you're trying to build and what the rest of the players in your rotation are actually experiencing when they play basketball. Well, yeah, to me, those are so many different type of issues, right? So if, if I was just, when I watch an NBA game, and I watch a guy occupy the right corner without moving for possessions on end. Like to me, those minutes are much different than the minutes that, like you mentioned, when James James Harden was in peak Houston form, having the ball on every possession. And and I think what Houston came to is. We run a pick and roll, maybe that's not, you know, because they're going to look at it from strictly a mathematical standpoint. Maybe that's not the best use. And um, that's why I think they went heavy isolation. I think, is he isolated? I think the game had to not be as enjoyable for the other four guys. I, I, I don't care what level you're at. When you watch a guy, um, have the ball in his hands uh, as much as some of these guys have, and you're relegated to just standing in the corner. It's one of the reasons I'd like to see the corner three eliminated, where you know there's no three point shot below the corner to make that area on the floor one where you're not just planting guys. We're we're basically going to force you to move by eliminating that as a three point shot. And the, sh- and the three-point line to me would be ended where the break is. Everything below the break, you're, you know, it's two-point basketball. Um, so I, I do I, – I totally agree with Coach Brown from an enjoyment standpoint. I think it may elevate other guys. And I also think, Ryan, um, their level of enjoyment for the whole season. But I, I've never been um, a believer that regular season analytics – is necessarily the best way for postseason success. I think that's why you need to have more offensive balance. I think that's why the mid-range jump shot is important in the in the playoffs, to have an ability for one or two of your guys on your team, like Durant, like Kyrie Irving, um, when they take away the basket and they push up on the three, that your best players have an alternative to go to. Um, and so I think there's a lot – of interesting things. I think uh, Larry Brown uh, was really intelligent, obviously, as a coach, but even how how it pertains to today's basketball, because what may be best may also be unenjoyable for some. And I don't know if you feel this way. Some NBA games, like to me, because so many teams are playing the, you know, vastly similar styles, um, it can be monotonous at times. Yeah, look, I, I'm I'm with you. I mean, I still I still love it so much, right? But I'll have nights, and like I felt guilty. I felt guilty about this Doncic run because it's absurd. But then I'm always thinking, like, okay, but what does it mean? And when I look at Dallas, I don't have the answer. Like, I think it's the ultimate compliment that sometimes Doncic bores me. That's how brilliant he is. That's how easy it is for him. And I mean it as a compliment, but at times I'm like, oh, okay, he just, he's just going to be able to do whatever he wants. But then when I try to build that out, I go, okay, Dallas doesn't have this great team around him. We know they're missing three of the rotation guys. What's the best way to build? And then I'm like, it might be who they are now. Like, would it make sense to have this other initiator, which they kind of did with Brunson. And I think they did a really good job of kind of staggering how those guys work together and how they'd work without each other. Um, We know that it takes more talent. Your number two has to be better than Dallas's number two to be a real title contender. But Doncic is so fantastic. But at the same time, I wonder, like, is this 
is this the right playoff approach? Like if everybody's involved and everybody's going, like, or would another team just sell out in a way and the help would be there and the rotations would be just locked in more because they know the playoffs are on the line as opposed to a Tuesday in December? Well, I think, you know, I saw this like for the first time back in the bubble where the Lakers were playing uh, Houston. Houston won game one in their series. And Harden, you know, it was that Harden-Westbrook grouping where they had really sold out. They had traded Capella, I believe, and they were playing, you know, like five, you know, sort of smallish, but the ball was in Harden's hands basically every possession. Yeah, Tucker was going to be center, remember? Like, Tucker was going to play center. He's batting with Steven Adams in the first round. And he's he's in the deep corner. And, you know, so anyway. I, the Lakers, I thought, did a great job after game one of playing Harden like one-on-one. And then they, when he was in that slot area and he's looking to go as he's measuring people with, the, you know, 100 dribbles between the legs, you know, they would come over what I would term fire and fire and double team. And it was a little bit later in the clock. And then they would rotate. Uh, you know, obviously they'd be in full rotation, but instead of having the trapper then get to the weak side, they ran the guy from the, the defender from the strong side corner all the way as the ball moved corner to corner. And I thought it was brilliant. And it didn't mean they stopped Harden or they stopped Houston, but I thought that one defensive adjustment um, really was important to slowing them breaking rhythm, not allowing the best player just to absolutely dominate um, in isolation situations. To me, I'd be shocked if you didn't see that more with Doncic now. I, I just, I don't think because of his great talent, even though he's an unworldly passer, that you can be so afraid of the three that you just let this guy, you know, dominate the ball, dominate the game. I think you'll start seeing against these great players more and more of these late double teams to try to break rhythm. You've seen Ty Lue and the Clippers do the same thing uh, at times to to Doncic uh, in the playoffs. So I think that's coming about. And the other thing I would think about with a guy like Doncic is if he's going to handle the ball full court, I think you've got to commit an, another guy to picking the ball up full court, particularly in the playoffs. But I would even do it in the regular season with a great player like that. I'm not just going to let them do exactly what they want. Throw it to Doncic, trot it down, run a pick and roll, get the switch you want, and then let him go one-on-one. He's going to win that battle. Yeah, because I've seen teams, I forget which game it was, whatever. It, it was, they actually tried to just sell out and trap them, like as soon as you cross half court. You're like, okay, you may catch him at possession, but then, you know, you bring the other guy up. He has the outlet. They're playing four on three. Like, this isn't, you, I almost feel like with Doncic, you got to treat him like a great quarterback, like a Manning or a Brady, where we're going to give you every look. We're going to double you on the first movement. We're going to double you. You know, if you if you catch it in the post, we're going to let you dribble, then double. You know what I mean? We can't we can't do the same thing every single time. And I think in the course of a regular season, it's really hard. But when you have the rematches in the playoff series, I think it becomes a little bit easier. And because of what's on the line there, I mean, and this is all a compliment, but I, it kills. Gives, I just feel guilty sometimes where I'm watching, going, I can't believe how easy it is for him. And this is against the best players in the world. I mean, that, yeah. that's what. To me, and that's why, but I go back to the practice thing too, Ryan, in that, you know, you would devote X amount of minutes per day or per week or per month to great player defense back then. Like, okay, we know we're going to face these. If we make the playoffs, we're going to face these dudes, you know, but we're not going to like make it up, you know, the term adjustments. Usually adjustments is going to something that you already have practiced. Those are the best adjustments, but you have to give yourself enough time uh, in practice, but also game reps against other guys. So I think you feel comfortable in trying, you know, what you're just mentioning X, Y, Z. I wouldn't think in football, they're just making it up on game day saying, Hey, uh, 
uh, Brady's hurting us with this. Hey, why doesn't the uh, cornerback uh, like let's have a safety blitz? You know, I, I that's not how it works. So I, I I think a lot of this defensive answers, and it's probably not going back this way, could go back to some increased practice time. And I'm not saying beat on the guys. I'm not saying physically beat on them, but I, I think to ask guys to come in and give you a good solid hour of work on the day between games is not asking too much. I, I hate to be so cliche with this, but I, I feel like I always want to ask you one Jordan question. You know what? I feel like one Jordan question is always a good idea. I mean, do you think he'd get 50 today with the spacing? And like, cause I look, maybe you'll, you'll get upset. I feel like the physical nature of the play is a little overstated from that era, like as if no one ever got a layup, you know, like everybody was killed. Like we see some of these Detroit highlights that'll make their way on Twitter. And it's like, you know, it wasn't like that every play. Um, and the spacing was so bad that it congested it. But at the same time, guys weren't defending every inch of the court the way they feel like they're scrambling now. Like you drive, kick out, and if they want to swing it, it's it's tough to defend today's offense. So it's still... <laughs> It's still Jordan, so I don't want to like say no. He wouldn't be able to do this. He would be a better three point shooter. He would have grown up with it. You know, like all of those things check out. I just wonder what you think of with the rules, the calls, the spacing. What it would be like if he played today? Well, if you think back, I think Phil Jackson would have been a Larry Brown proponent in what he said. I don't think they ran the triangle because he thought it was the maximum way to score on each possession from opening night on. I think he thought it was the best offense so that everyone touched the ball, everyone um, felt a part of it, and everyone was most confident when the ultimate double teams did come in fourth quarters of the hardest games. Um, so. I think it was a great offensive rebounding offense. I think it was a great offense so that everyone felt involved. I thought the flexibility that everyone had to play, you know, in the post or on the perimeter, all those things were great things. But it also, it, if you would give the ball to Jordan in his prime with these rules, with all the shooting, and think that he wasn't going to shoot over 50%. He, he shot over 50% with limited three-point shooting, so it was limited space in the triangle offense and the hand check or decapitation defense, you know, like whatever you, 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 you employed, right? At the very least, it was hand checks, and at the, at the highest form of physicality, you know, the Pistons or the Knicks, you know, trying to, you know, take your head off. So there's no question he would have led the league in scoring. No question he would have played. Uh, he would have shot over 50%, lived at the free throw line. And like you said, I think he absolutely would have been an outstanding three-point shooter because of, you know, right. practice, work, and it just being, a, you know, a more emphasized uh, point of view. Now, to, like, all right, that being said, would, would he average 50 I don't know. He's not averaging 50, but would he have averaged 40? That's quite possible.